everyone, my name is Lene Cravens. I'm the Exhibition and Events Manager here with GOCA, or the Galleries of Contemporary Art here at UCCS. Um, you are sitting in our project space, which we are featuring Eric Wilson's awesome exhibition. Um, so thank you so much for coming to the show and coming to hear Eric talk about his work. Um, it's a pretty unique and super engaging story about this body of work, so I hope you really enjoy the conversation. Um, but Eric is actually a faculty member here at UCCS, but not in our School of Art, in our School of Business. And so I find that really interesting because I think a lot of people assume, especially with such a well thought out, solid body of work, everyone's like, is he on the art faculty? I'm like, no, but he's just very dedicated to the practice of making this work. And so um, I think it's surprising because the work is so good and you'd expect you have gone into art, but we'll hear more about that from Eric. But um, I want to thank you again for coming to our exhibition. Um, we do have some other exhibitions up in the building, so if you haven't had a chance to go see C. Zhang show in our other space, please stop by before you leave or come back. And that shows up till July, so you have a lot more time to see that. But um, um, I'm going to pass it over to Eric so he can just tell you everything about his story and this work. And um, I'm excited to hear what he's saying. So. so thank you, Lynn, okay. Linnae, Linnae, yes. and uh, Abigail and their crew. And if there's an opening in the art school, I'll switch over. Yes, to that well, because it's more interesting that's a know. question for VAPA, but um, they would be lucky to have you there. Um, thank you. <laughs> so, thank you uh, to your whole group. I also want to thank my wife, who over the last two years has put up with me confiscating half the garage, my pounding, my sawing, my hammering, my cursing, a few other mm -hmm. things that, during this period as I produce these. And Chancellor Reddy, who, who introduced me to Daisy McGowan. And she's not here because of her, her new job up in uh, Denver, but working with her was just outstanding. It, when I pitched this a couple of years ago, I really thought she'd say, well, it's nice you want to be an artist, but this is reserved for a real artist. But she didn't. She came and she showed me this space and she said, would this work? And I'm like, yeah, this would be outstanding. So just her professionalism, her demeanor, has just been a, a real joy to work with. So. The title of my show is Hiatus, and I don't know how to work a clicker even though I've been a professor for 30 years. <laughs> and Hiatus is a pause or a gap in a sequence, series, or process. So eight of the paintings you see up on the wall here were originally the creation of this young man between 1974 and 84. Uh, and at that point, 1984, after working a lot of odd jobs and driving forklift and uh, teaching tennis and being a bartender and a variety of things, he decided time to return to school. So I went to the graduate school in uh, 1987 and, or, excuse me, 84, and out of the next seven, eight years, I spent seven years earning my master's and my doctorate until 1992 when I started here as an assistant professor in the College of Business. At that point, I pretty much put art away as I focus on my academics, my research, my teaching, my administrative responsibilities, and along with my wife, Chris, raising our two children, Kai and Kira. 29 years later, when COVID hit, uh, I had the opportunity to stay home for a while. I was trying to figure out what am I gonna do? Well, I thought if I'm ever gonna turn these original sketches that I produced back uh, in the early 70s and 80s, now is the time to do it. So hiatus, the ideas, the models were, came from a series of sketch pads, again, that go back 40 to almost 50 years. And that's why I call it hiatus, or the title. Now, before I move on, I'm gonna stop referring to myself as a third person, because it's obnoxious. But also, I will say, for those who think academics is a posh career, all I can say is, look what happened to this guy over the course of uh, 30 <laughs> years. Or so. so the story, though, actually goes back a generation before me, because my father, Richard Life Olson, uh, was born and raised in a very small town in northern Minnesota during the Depression. Uh, his father was a master carpenter, but also an alcoholic who was just gone at times. His mother worked in the factory, the nearby uh, paper factory, basic worker. He had two younger sisters. So he's pretty much left to his own devices, which meant he didn't really do much in school. The high school counselors recommended that he drop out and go work at the paper mill because it was clear that's what he was going to end up doing for a career. But he, he stayed and got his high school degree. 
And then World War II erupted, and he signed up for the United States Marine Corps. And I asked him why, and he said because he thought if you ever got into a really horrific situation, that the Marine Corps would provide the toughest um, training and the best chance of survival. Well, that was true, but it didn't actually make for the, the easiest parent, to be honest. He came out of World War II, out of his service, with two things. And the first was discipline. And I grew up with that discipline. I can't say it was the, the most enjoyable uh, time. Um, in second grade, we started getting up every morning, seven days a week at 4.30 and going to Long Beach State, running five miles, 20 laps around the track before we come home, do a series of exercises, wind down, get ready for school, whatever. During the summer, we spent a lot of time hiking in the uh, Sierras. Uh, I've done the John Muir Trail, which is over 200 miles four times. My dad and my brothers have done the whole Pacific Crest Trail, over 2,000 miles. He's the kind of guy who would go canoe the McKinsey River towards the Arctic Ocean. The kind of guy that if you crashed in the plane in the mountains and survived, you'd want him there because he's going to get you out. But he was a, a pretty demanding uh, father. The second thing that he got from his time in the Marine Corps was the GI Bill. And he used this to go back and get his bachelor's degree at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And then when we moved out to Southern California in the 50s, his MFA, Master of Fine Arts at Long Beach State, where you see, my father was an artist. And I grew up surrounded by art. So we had all of the tools that you would ever want, you know, the paper and the pencils and the paints and the ceramics and the clays, and he would take us to exhibits, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, or to Taliesin West to see the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright. But most important, we saw him producing across his whole life. So just a real quick sampling, his mid-century hand-carved black walnut furniture. You're not going to find any metal and screws, etc., cetera, in, in these pieces. His wood sculptures. His bronze castings, his oil paintings, his pastels, his weavings, his graphite pencil drawings, his weed pots and his bowls, and on and on. It's just a tiny sampling. You can see, my father was an artist, but I also saw the frustration he had in trying to sell. And the very few times he tried to sell, sometimes he wasn't even offered the cost of materials, let alone the creative insights and the work that went into it. And so I was not inclined to pursue that career. Uh, I looked at it and just said, you know, that, that's a lot of work and effort. But he did what he wanted to do. He made his own, and he made a career uh, by teaching. Now, before I go on, I, so when I got to high school, consequently, I, I didn't take art, I took theater. At the end of four years of theater, I determined I had a face for radio and a voice for mine. So <laughs> I wasn't going to make a career in, in, in theater, but it's helped me with lecturing. But before I go off of this, just one quick story. In seventh grade, started junior high school, all the boys had to take a woodchop and all the girls took a home ec. And in the woodchop class, you had your obligatory projects, your sanding block, your tie rack. But at the end of the semester, you could make anything you wanted. Every boy wanted to make a skateboard because in 1965, the skateboard is just taking off. You can make a custom board with you know, exotic woods and inlays. And I wanted to do that too. And my dad said, no, you're going to make a carving. I said, I don't want to make a carving. He goes, tough, you're making a carving. So somehow we settled on this idea of a bird. I don't remember why. But he told me, start sketching out some ideas and we'll meet in two days to go over it. Two days later, he calls me and says, Eric, get in here, let's see your sketches. I had completely blown it off. I went to my room, and within a matter of, I think, 10 to 15 seconds, I traced out like six lines, kind of looked like a bird. So I brought it in to show him, and he looked at it and said, okay, he said, well, let's see the rest of them. I said, well, this is the best one, which it clearly was, it's the only one out there. So I bring this up because, and then he brought home a piece of mahogany and with uh, coping saws and rasp and finer and finer uh, uh, sandpaper. Took it down to the, the shape that I was looking for and then brought home another piece for a vase. Well, 60 years later, I'm guessing all those skateboards are gone, but I still have my bird. And while you may not look upon this as fine art, this was made by a 12-year-old. 
because of my influence from my father. So even though I didn't pursue art, I, I still had it in my background. All right, I go off to college, and I'm a history major following my mother's passion. She has a master's degree in history. And like any good liberal arts school, though, you've got to take classes outside your domain. So when it comes to art, I sign up for an art history class. And in that class, we are presented with the uh, ideas of neoplasticism uh, and Pierre Mondrian. Now, art history is usually about remembering names and dates and isms and tying things together. And certainly that was in this class. But the professor said, I want you to take the six principles of neoplasticism and make your own little artwork, but you have to break one of the six principles. So almost every student just got a piece of typing paper and they did some right angles and some primary colors. But I really got into this. So I got three big pieces of high quality art paper and I put together a sequence and I submitted it, and it's the only time in my life I got an A+. Plus. Uh, and I was so enamored with this that after I graduated, I turned it in, I, I went and redid it on canvas, as uh, actual paintings. And so this was the project, and one of the principle I broke was uh, repeated shapes. So um, anyhow, when I went to get this, the materials in downtown Portland, uh, the canvas, the paint, the gesso, et cetera, there was a little display, and it was a jury show, announcement of a jury show titled American Painters in Paris. So it was 1975, and 1976 is the biennial, 100 year anniversary. And so the French government is one of their activities to kind of honor the American Revolution, was going to hold a show of American artists in Paris. Well, I took a picture of it, I filled out the form, and kind of on a lark, I sent it in, and Lo and behold, it got accepted. So uh, I was like, geez, what do I do now? And it was held at the Pompidou Center. And if you've been to Paris, this amazing building is just blocks from Notre Dame and uh, the Louvre and not far from Museum d'Orsay. And I guess if it's good enough for Matisse, it's probably good enough for me. But the problem here was that I had just graduated from college. I was making $2 an hour as the dumpiest biker bar in Portland. Uh, my parents were high school, junior high school teachers, so they weren't wealthy, and we had, they paid for the majority of my college, and I had three younger siblings coming along. So I just didn't feel I could ask them to send my squares to, to uh, Paris, so I didn't get to send it. Years later, I presented a paper uh, in, at a conference, design management conference in Paris, and the organizers held a, a banquet up in the top floor, the mayor of Paris came, and all these dignitaries, very fancy, and I was just kicking myself. One of my three big regrets in life, but say let me, uh, didn't, didn't, didn't work out. But nonetheless, I got the acceptance. Now, uh, taking art history was fine, but the, the school wanted you to actually get your hands dirty, to actually you know, take something that was real, tangible art. And so I signed up for a year's worth of design courses. And this was at Lewis and Clark College. And the first day of the semester, I went down to the art building, atrium, lower campus, sun shining through. There's like 20 some odd students standing around. And in the middle of the students is this one other kid. And he's standing there in cut off shorts. He's got on a Ziggy Stardust t-shirt. He's got on a David Bowie mullet hairdo. And he's got a British accent. And he turns out to be the professor. Well, he's just out of his MFA at Yale. And before that, Norwich, uh, college in, the, in uh, the UK, and so we've got this young, edgy, uh, cool professor, but design is serious. It's not just doing anything you want. There's structure to it, but each quarter he takes us to the Portland Center for the Visual Arts, where I get exposed to people like Helen Frankenthaler and Sam Morris and uh, uh, James Rosenquist and the like, and, but the one that has the most influence on me is Frank Stella. And I see these paintings for the first time, and it's kind of an epiphany. Like, paintings don't have to be rectangular. They don't have to be two-dimensional. They don't actually have to have paint on some of them here. And so this becomes a big influence. Now, in this class, we have an assignment uh, based on um, um, uh, Joseph um, Albert's color theory. And the assignment is we have to make one color look as though it's two colors. So we've got these little pre-printed packets of artist colors, and we've got to cut these out and position them so that they, they make this appearance. 
So I make these little triangles and little rectangles I put together over the weekend and I bring it into the professor and he really likes it. He says, you know, you ought to turn that into a real painting. So he, I'd never done anything like that, didn't exactly know what I was doing, but my dad sent me some, some uh, acrylics. And so the first thing that I ever produced were these. And you know, I, you know, hopefully these two greens look different, but they're actually exactly the same. So that was the, the, the project. But I produced these and showed them in the local uh, space, and uh, you will see that the influence is kind of left over so for some years. But I graduate from college, I'm working at jobs, but I keep continuing on with just emulating other artists. So somebody makes something, Jasper Johns has his flag, so I create my own Norwegian flag because I'm predominantly Norwegian, and because the right angles are easy to take off. Um, Roy Lichtenstein and his cartoon kind of art. I just saw this recently in a Tate Modern actual one. And I'm also though living in the Pacific Northwest, so I've got this influence of the Native mm -hmm. uh, Americans. I love the black edges, this, et cetera. So I kind of combined these two into a couple of paintings uh, that just at the time, I was working in the ski shop at that time. Uh, Andy Warhol, I get influenced by Andy Warhol, and of course he's known for his lithographs and his tomato soup cans, or soup cans. And by the way, this one of Maryland, uh, the one with a bluish background called Sage Shop Blue Maryland, last year sold for $195 million. Like, geez. Anyhow, he's also got a series, though, of tragedies, and oftentimes there's a blue tint to them. This one, obviously, Jackie Kennedy, but they're not all famous people. Well, when he dies, I decide to do my little own homage to him. And I come up with, I make this, which I titled Cooling Andy as uh, um, his own passing away. But even before this, I was influenced sort of by his idea of you know, the popular culture. And, and I did a series of photographs that I turned into then uh, watercolors over it of people in their cars, because that reflected something of their personality. And so here's one with my mom with a very practical Volvo, with my father with his camper, and Joseph Albers, I mentioned before, and his uh, homage to the square. So I make my own version of that, which I titled Marriage. And then I actually get a commission. The commission is at the First Unitarian Church downtown in their Sunday school, and the commission is, they'll pay for the paint if I paint the wall. And so I agree to this, and this is a... Uh, titled Solstice, and the idea is that we, no one actually knows when uh, Jesus was born, but we adopt that the 24th and 5th is a holiday because of pagan uh, tradition, the solstice returning of the sun and the, uh, the um, uh, celebration that went on with that. So anyhow, it gave uh, kids in Sunday school something to talk about. All right, so I've mentioned that we spend the summers in the, in the mountains oftentimes, there are four kids. Uh, each kid got to adopt a peak. I'm the oldest, so I got to claim half dome. And I have climbed this, but not the face. If you go around the backside, there's actually a big ladder, a cable ladder. Now, you still wouldn't want to fall off, but nonetheless, it's not <laughs> quite the face. But I bring this up because there's a couple of influences I'll, I'll come back to. But as you go up this, you realize it's not one solid rock, that there are layers, like an onion that you've got to step over here. And as you're up on this, you know it's a solid mass, but you're also realizing you're not really on the ground. And so you're kind of detached, even though it's a massive rock. So I'm going to come back to that theme in just a second. Now, from this, I create some metal sculpture ideas and some uh, rock and some combined. And so this idea of detached uh, I remember seeing this picture painting at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and it's just like, whoa, who comes up with this idea of a massive boulder just floating out in space? So I always, I always just like that uh, idea, but again, mass but detached from the ground. And then my favorite movie was 2001, uh, Space Odyssey, and you see the, the monolith through a variety of scenes. But near the end of it, here again, you have this massive item just floating out in space. So these three influences came together in what I titled Igneous Sculpture. And I've got the model back here. And so that's basically the idea there. And I did another one uh, dealing with the glacial polish. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But 
some, some prototype models. And then I did a series of arches uh, where, where the metal and wood or um, rock combined. And from the arches series, then I get back to painting. So I have a series of paintings dealing with arches. I think arches are very positive. We've got the Arc de Triomphe, heavy. This is about the victory of war, nothing delicate about it, very uh, massive. I have the influence of the French flag, the tricolors, and then uh, the Sun King, Louis, the, whatever. I can't remember all of my Louis out there. But I take these influences and I create a painting, a uh, watercolor that looks like that. And I actually like that. So back in 1984, I actually uh, produced that. That's about five feet across and about 300,000 pounds. <laughs> and it's called Triumph. I went looked at uh, Tori, Japanese Tori arches with the red beams and the, the black little across. And then the uh, Japanese circular flag. I took those influences and I created this little paint or watercolor. And again, I like that. So I produced that one back in about 84. And the third one, uh, the Gateway Arch in St. Louis, massive, but very delicate in many ways. And then the American flag colors, and I turned that into watercolor, but I haven't actually ever uh, gotten around to making that one. So these are part of a series of watercolors from these, again, these uh, uh, artist pads I had. Some of them I like, some of them less so, but that brings us to the paintings here, what's on the walls. So. Eight of the 10 pieces go back, date back to the 70s and the 80s. And two of them are a little newer, and I'll explain that in a second. So, what are they about? Well, what you see is what you see. So I steal the line from Frank Stella. It, I didn't set out like, like Picasso to uh, say, I'm going to detail the horrors of the Spanish Civil War and create something. I just sketched and came up with sketches and ideas that I liked and refined, so there was no inherent meaning ahead of time. I have written post hoc stories to go with them, but after the fact. It's more just about the joy of the creative process, coming up with something I enjoy and, and like. So again, there's no inherent meanings. I have written stories after the fact, but any story you come up with that you see is perfectly fine as well. Now the titles. There were no titles originally, and when I looked to, to put titles on them, it's like Hard Edge Painting 1, Hard Edge Painting 2, very, very dull and boring. So what I did is I borrowed song titles from about the era in which they were created, and I was looking for upbeat songs. I didn't want anything like the eve of destruction, you know, but I also don't have overt love songs in here. So basically, they can be a little edgy, but they're positive. Now the two with the black edgings on them, there's one under here. These were pieces of wood that were left over that I put canvas over, but I tried to fit um, designs to existing pieces. All the others were cut to match what I wanted, but the other two are, are just more recent ones. So to go through it, there's the original watercolor for the one on the end, and the final piece, and uh, of the title I borrowed from Mr. Springsteen. This really has nothing to do with China. It's more about a man who wins a lottery and gets to do anything he wants, which is kind of what I've been able to do here. Wildly optimistic song from my college days I always enjoyed. a little bit of free hand in, in painting. As you see, I come back to this theme. I originally wanted to do a blue one. I had enough space or enough materials to do an orange one. But by the time I got done, I, I preferred combining the blue and orange. This one I like, but I never liked the muddy colors, so I changed it. I went to pastels. 
which against the dark background really pops. A little bit lost, I think, in the white background. Then the last two, which again were uh, designed later. And while this isn't an overt statement against uh, the war in Ukraine, when I had to choose which side was up and which side was down, I chose the blue and yellow as the Ukrainian flag on top over you know, the Russian color being the bottom. And the way I designed it is like a reverse C because uh, the Russians adopted Z, even though it's not part of the Cyrillic alphabet, as their war symbol. So it's a subtle little uh, protest against you know, horrible uh, atrocities that are being committed. And then this last piece, All right, so as I wrap this up, my father was an artist, and yet he had to teach because I uh, really couldn't make a living producing, but he influenced thousands of lives of young people, including mine. And for that, I am ever grateful, and to him, I say thank you, and for those of you who took the time to come today, I can also say thank you. Thank you. We have a few minutes, so if anyone has questions for Eric about the work in the show or anything in his presentation, like, it's not a great time to ask these questions. Can you show us what they look like on the back? Wouldn't you have something okay. about that? Because um, that's really cool how they're <laughs> stretched. So I take the pictures and uh, I figure the ratios, I put them. Everything has to be fitted into a four by eight sheet of plywood. They're two layers thick so that they don't warp. Uh, and I put a million uh, wood screws into them. We get the design, we cut it out with uh, saws, best I can. We put quarter edging, quarter round the dowling on the edges so that when we stretch the canvas, it doesn't show anything except the edge. And then you uh, wrap them and they have to sew up the corners before they, you know, so they don't rip. We just sew them a few times, sand them down, put a couple of layers of titanium white on so the colors will pop. You put the tape down, you tape over the edges so that they don't bleed or as little as possible. Choose which colors you actually want. Actually get the paint, roll the tape up, which is kind of the fun part, unless it bleeds. For some of these fine lines, that was quite a challenge. A lot of tape. <laughs> <laughs> My best sculpture. Anyhow, and so then the back looks like this. So some of these that have multiple pieces to hold them together, you know, the unglamorous side out there. And then finally, the uh, trying to figure out where on the wall do they hang and how am I going to lift them up given how much they weigh. <laughs> That's the basic process there. Any other questions? Yep. You said that the titles were kind of an afterthought. It was kind of a retro effort. And you said when you started, you didn't have what, when you started, you wanted the creative process. You wanted to experience that. And that we are free to add whatever interpretation we want. But there must have been a seed in your mind when you start it, you know, am I gonna go rectangular, am I gonna go square, am I gonna go circular? How, how did you identify that? How did you ideate that? The problem is, should... that was a lot of bottles of wine and beer ago, 40, 50 <laughs> years ago. Um, so the process <laughs> a little bit faded, but basically it was just sitting down at night and the, the dinner table and have TMD on the background and sketching. Coming up with ideas, and I don't really remember where I got them, but a lot of them were thrown away. Now, for those that you like, there are pages and pages of things that, that didn't work. So, uh, again, and I, I, there's usually an asymmetry. Something is, is you know not perfectly balanced because that I think makes it more interesting. Um, I can tell you that this piece over here, I mean, post hoc. This is called Across the Universe, which I took from John Lennon. I just like the idea. It is black into white, white into black is a day and a night, night is a day, and that's why I have the feathering there rather than the precision, because it's not perfect. And then the colors, 
going across. Well, primary colors in, in pigment are yellow, red, and blue. Okay, or cyan and magenta, and you know. In electronics, though, it can be green, blue, and red. And so we can see across the universe, see these, these galaxies billions of years away by the, uh, um, oh, what's the term, the, uh, the spectrum that, that they see. And I don't understand that, I'm not an you know, uh, engineer. But that's why, and then also just kind of the, the Hindu idea of birth and stability and death and regeneration and over and over again. So that's my post hoc. But when I sat down to do it, I probably just said, yeah, let's paint here. Let's see what it looks like if I don't paint the whole thing white or black or something like that. But alas, it was a long, long time ago in another galaxy. When you did Trion, were you thinking of France and Paris? And yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, because you know, I've been there. I've seen that. In the, in, in, I just like the arches, but it, that is it's so massive, it's just heavy. You know, there's nothing delicate really about it, and so big kind of clunky squares, etc. And if you've been to Versailles, you know, and the, the, all the twists and glamour of the Sun King, I don't have a great history of French Renaissance. You were in the 14th. 14th. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh -huh. I was going to say 15th. Yeah, I like, it's interesting, as an artist, sometimes you make work and you have this really strong theme that you're going for, so like, I think the Arch series, you had a theme, you had a, um, a system you were working from, kind of, it looks, feel like, here's the arch I'm thinking of, here's the color palette, and then creating a piece out of this formula that you came up with, but sometimes you make things and you're like, I don't know why, this just feels right, and then later you start to dissect it a little bit and go, okay, this makes sense, because I was thinking this, or you know, I think if you're talking about that piece, I get a lot of that like sense, like once you actually start to like, you have to confront the piece a little bit and go, oh, but I see this connection. I picked the song, but there's probably all these like subconscious reasons why I chose that song. And sometimes you don't know what it is and sometimes you know, and kind of the wonderful mystery of being an artist is you get to just say, well, that's just how I wanted to do it. But I could take a dull thing and write an interesting story. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the, the sculpture pieces, specifically the ones uh, detached, being up, it's like, how do I bring the experience of being on the side of a, a mountain or a cliff to an urban setting and the massive scale of it, etc. And that's what I was trying to do. And whether I succeed or not, I don't know. But that's, that's the idea. There was an idea. It wasn't just, well, let's put some rocks here. And that's the models you have. That's the right? models. Now, yeah. Yeah. Is your idea for that to be like, monumental kind of public art? Well, I've got a, I've got a, a little animal there on one of them to set up, but you know, it's like nine feet tall, I think, or something like that. I want them tall enough that they're imposing, but I don't want them so tall that people are necessarily climbing all over them and you know, falling off and suing me. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Eric. This was an amazing opportunity to hear more about not only this work, but honestly, your entire career of art. It's, um, inspiring and interesting to hear about.